Great, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for firstly coming to my session and, and choosing me. I know there was two other sessions that you could have been in today, so I really am um, here to hopefully make this really worthwhile and engaging and a bit interactive as well. Um, I'm here to share a few stories with you, um, some ideas, and hopefully maybe to change um, your perceptions or to question kind of maybe your journey and where you currently are and, and where you're going. But before I continue um, along the journey, can I have a volunteer, please? Yes, great. Uh, round of applause for volunteer. <coughs> and James, what's your name? Ash. Ash, cool. Stay there, second. <laughs> cool. Here you go. Jar of beans. Hold that for a second. There you go. Hold on. And, uh, cool. Lovely student beans T-shirt. There you go. Okay, you. That's right. That's what you need. Go and sit down. Thank you very much. <laughs> round of applause again. So I guess my question for everyone in the room, and what I'd like you to do is just turn to the person next to you. Um, if you're not sitting next to someone, please go and just bunch up so you can go and sit next to somebody or move um, so that you can just kind of engage and ask them the question, why didn't you volunteer? So a really simple question, but I'd like you to just introduce yourself to the person next to you. Why did you not volunteer? And you've just got a couple of minutes to ask. Okay, everyone. So, does does anyone want to share why they didn't volunteer? Yeah, at the back, straight first. Yeah, because the fear of the unknown. Yeah. I don't think that there's going to be an advantage or benefit from that. Great. Yeah. Anyone else? Why? Yeah. I was going to wait till um, for it to be a little bit awkward and then put my hand up. Okay. So give, give, give build the tension in the room. Ash was far too quick, so he didn't let the tension rise which is always normally there's, it takes a little longer sometimes for someone to put themselves forward. Fair enough. Anyone else? Why didn't you? Someone from this side of the room? Maybe the same reason why you're not putting yourself forward now. <laughs> Guy, Ash was just too quick. Yeah, sometimes, you know, that's, that's right. anyone from the middle bit just want to share why you didn't volunteer? Practically, so yeah, you know, it's too difficult. I guess there's an, ex you know, and we, and we create though, opportunities are presented every single day and we create similar excuses. Oh, it's, it's not possible. I don't, maybe I don't want to take the opportunity from someone else because I'm normally always that person that volunteers or, or whatever it is. Um, so there was some research that was done in the 1970s and death came third. What do you think the most two feared things are in the world? Yeah, so number one, public speaking. I'm now doing the most feared thing in the world. Uh, great for a Sunday morning, uh, Sunday afternoon. And what else? What's the second most feared thing in the world? No, death is, came third. Uh, marriage is probably up there. <laughs> uh, so the second most feared thing is, is networking. It's going to a room, room full of people who you don't know, and then you're at the fetch. It's, ama it's amazing, though, when we're growing up, Think about how many times, one, we're told no. Um, two, what are we told when we're growing up? Don't talk to strangers, right? And then it's amazing that we're expected to go into, into university and go into the wider world of work and build connections and network with people. And it's amazing, though, I guess, how much is ingrained and how no. But you know, when you want someone, when you want something and you're a kid, you just keep going and you keep asking. But then it's not really surprising, you know, a room full of educated people and I ask for a volunteer and there's just this kind of sense of, and, and you, you said it spot on, the first thing, we all thought, and if you listen to what yourself tells yourself, no one was stopping you, no one had tied you down to your seat, making you be there. You didn't even know what I was going to do or ask for, but you all kept yourself and you told yourself probably something bad was going to happen. And so I guess I'm here today as a bit of a challenge um, to hopefully to get you to think slightly differently. Um, so there's a, a famous quote that I really like, which your thoughts, they become words. Which your words, they become actions. Which your actions, they become habits. Which your habits, they become character. Which your character, it becomes your destiny. And for me here today is about just hopefully suggesting, and I said I'm going to share a bit of a story and about student beans, etc. But from a really a kind of a background point of view, what's really stopping you and what's holding yourself back? And you know, coming to 
conferences and events like this are really, really fantastic, but no one's going to do it for you. And I guess the real challenge is what, what are you going to take? What are you going to do? What are the things that you're going to change? And hopefully today, if you imagine if you just change just a, a, a one degree angle of where you're going or you're headed or your direction, um, you know, where that might be and how exciting and the opportunity might be. But hopefully to share, unfortunately, I'm not a superhero. I don't have superpowers, um, but I was 22 when I graduated. And instead of going to work for somebody, I decided to, to set up my own company. But even before that, um, and a kind of a life lesson that I really like, hopefully, if, if you want to take this away with you, it's about what you can give. And in every situation, what can you give? And if you all applied that, if you think when I asked for a volunteer at the beginning of the session, if you're like, yeah, what, what can I give? Not, not being afraid and not holding back. The session, is a, it's about you. It's not about me. I guess I know everything inside my head. And um, so hopefully it's about engaging you as much as possible. The more that you give, hopefully, to the session, the more that you will more gain, but also applying that um, to kind of wi wider opportunities and kind of wider life. So I know the session was about kind of the challenges, the entrepreneurial journey. I thought I'd kind of split it into three things around kind of one, starting up. Uh, to surviving, but we don't want to just survive, we want to succeed, hopefully. And, um, you know, a show of hands, how many people have already set up a business? You set up. How many of you are thinking they want to set up a business? And how many of you are like, no, I'm just here for the ride, but I'm never going to set up a business? That's okay. That's, uh, <laughs> there may be some of those in the room, and that's fine, but it's great to see um, so many people kind of really investing in, in yourselves and, and considering. How many, just out of show of hands, how many people are on Twitter? How many people are, about, how many people have tweeted in the last two days? Do you like? Say something. Okay, I encourage you also to just to tweet during the session. Um, and I want this session, I want everyone else at the conference to be like, why wasn't I in this session? I missed out on this session. So if you can help me do that as well, that would be really, really great. Um, and that's my intent is to, to give you as much as I can to make, make that happen. Um, okay, so from a startup perspective, so I just wanted to share kind of a couple of brief stories with you um, just to set the context because I feel. It's almost the end result is that I, I set up Student Beans on a certain level, but it's the things that I did before and the opportunities available to all of you at whatever stage you're at before um, whilst in setting up the business, but about going into situations um, where you're then really able to make, make a difference and contribute. So um, has anyone done Young Enterprise in the room? Any people Young Enterprise? Yeah? So do you want to share what you did, Young Enterprise? What was your...? Yeah, it was like a student art leadership business. Okay, cool. Um, so we basically got art from students at, at their own need. Yeah. Uh, had exhibitions and sold them on. Great, cool. So very innovative. That's great. I've never heard that before. Um, so I ended up um, setting up something, um, and it was called needanumber.co.uk. So it was a website in 1999-2000. And to set the scene, it was a Friday afternoon at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and I walked into this shop, and this woman literally screamed at me, get out, whatever you're selling, get out of my shop. Now, I guess my question for you is, who would have left? Who would have left, left the room? You can put up your hand. It's all right. Quite a lot of people, I'm sure, would have, would have literally gone, right, thank you very much. It's Friday afternoon. I've got better things to do with my time uh, rather than being screamed at. So I was in, the, in this shop, and I guess my question, what, what do all businesses want to do? They want to make what? Money. So all businesses, I was standing there, and I, a few things, and I guess from a, a, you'll hear maybe a number of entrepreneurs having already spoken and for the remainder of, of the, the conference, but you know, it's about belief, and it's about drive, and it's about passion. And I was standing there as an entrepreneur, as a young person, I was 17 years old, but I knew businesses want to make money, and I stood there believing in myself, believing in this idea. And the basic premise was, if the company paid us 20 pounds, so not a lot of money, they would be listed on our website. Um, and like maybe many directory services and, and websites at the time, they would say, if you work with us, you'll get more business. Because there are, we, we thought, we'll create this site and we'll have their opening times, some information, a link to their website, and all of those kind of things. It was very early for, for that kind of opportunity in 1999. And um, so after around 20 minutes, um, I said, look, the profits are going to be going to charity. We're a local school. And I kind of layered upon layer of why I shouldn't have just left um, and why she should be working with us. Um, and finally, we left with money in hand. So I guess my question for you is, what's the worst thing that could have happened in that situation? What's the worst thing that, when I went into the shop and tried to, what's the worst thing that could happen? She said, no. The best thing that could happen? So again, if you're going to just take one thing, and I'll say this a number of times, so hopefully you all take one thing, but if you're just going to take one thing from this session, asking that question is a really, really powerful question. What's the worst thing that can happen? And what's the best thing that can happen? Because when I asked for a volunteer at the beginning of the session, 99% of you-ish set kind of thought the worst thing was going to happen. And you didn't even know what that is, but you created an image in your mind of something basically bad. Like nothing really good could come from me volunteering. So it's what's the worst thing that can happen and what's the best thing that can happen. 
And if you apply that to everything, um, and there's, uh, the, there's a book called The Yes Man in the film. Has anyone seen The Yes Man? Seen the film or heard the book The Yes Man? So, you know, that's also a very similar mentality to thinking instead of just saying no, but question, and even if that's a bit like, oh, I don't want to do it, that's when you need to do it. That's when you need to say yes. That's when you need to push and challenge yourself. Um, so the other kind of short story that I wanted to share about, has anyone done telesales? Telesales? There's another yes in the room. Anyone else done telesales? Sold anything? Yeah, go for it. What, what have you sold over the phone? Or? All sorts. Um, All sorts. Big, big business partnerships. I mean, started the first ever telesales job I did as an insured medical student fund here. We raised money coming from alumni. We phone up alumni raising money. money. Great. Absolutely. So yeah. So a lot, a lot of those kind of things. So so I ended up doing uh, something for Gala Bingo, um, which is the most. I normally ask, guess which brand on on up there I've kind of worked with for telesales. But I did Gala Bingo, um, and I was calling up people, offering them a free membership and a free gift. Um, and I was working for for um, around six weeks. How many phone calls? Have a guess. How many phone calls do you think I made in a day? It was with a headset and it was all automated, so I wasn't literally sitting there dialing. How many phone calls do you think I made in a day? 200, very good guess, it was around 250. Um, and how many people do you think said yes to me? Be nice. What was my conversion rate percentage-wise? How many people do you think said yes? Uh, around 10, what was that? I heard a 10%. So 10% was absolutely right, spot on. So I did around 10%. So every day around 25 people said yes to me over the phone. Um, and this may sound like a trick question, you're all very clever. What, how many people, how many no's did I get? So it's not how many people, how many no's did I get? Trick question, but. No, I got a lot of no's, no, because I got, <laughs> there were, you know, 250 phone calls, 10% said yes, so 200, more than 225 no's. Anyone from this side? 100, well, 75% said no, but go on, one more guess, just a number higher than 225. 250, no, almost 700 no's every single day. Now, why? Why do you think I got so many no's? Aside from... I kept passing, so I kept asking. So our, our sales training, and I call it no training, but the sales training that they told us to do was we had to get them to say no three times. And it's like, you know, and I go, and when I ask the session as well, when, you, when you're a kid and you want something, you keep going, right? But now when we're going on, it's like, oh no, okay. But also, if you hear 700 no's, how do you, how do you think you would feel after 700 no's? After the first day, <laughs> 700 no's, how would you feel? Not great, right? So, and that was 700 no's each day, week after week after week, for six weeks, right? And instead of making it no, it wasn't a no to me, it wasn't a no to the idea, it was just a no, and it was for me, I called it no training. Because it's about learning how to just deal with that no, and if, you know, it's not like I was passionate necessarily about Gala Bingo. You know, it was a job, means to an end. I was making money before I went traveling. Um, but in essence, a lot of other people will apply in that situation and not necessarily take some learnings from it like I have done. But there are a few things. One, it was statistics. So every day, like I said, I got around 10%. So if you know that you're calling also the right demographic one day, is anyone from Dudley near Birmingham? So no, so there are lots of elderly people living in Dudley. And we ended up getting, I think, 42 people that day. And it's like, you know, if you're focused on a niche and you find something and you're speaking to the relevant target, one that you're going to get a higher conversion rate, it's a persistence, it's a numbers game. Even at four or five o'clock in the afternoon, if I hadn't hit my figures, it didn't matter because I knew that I was going to get through and it was consistent every single day. And also, no doesn't mean no. You know, the first time they said no. The other learning was no one's sitting there waiting for James to call them to go, I'm calling from the Gala Bingo Membership Center. You know, no one's sitting, everyone's in their world and they've had an argument with someone or they've got kids or whatever it is. And you've got to think, you know, asking that kind of permission and opportunity and think they're not just waiting for you. And so it's, it's a gift. And whenever we're doing business today, the biggest thing that we do is asking, is now a good time to talk? Do you have a minute to speak? Because it's getting permission. And I've worked with a number of brands over the last kind of six, seven years that sometimes it's taken six months where I've called them and I've gone, is now a good time? They say, no. I go, can I give you a call next week, Tuesday, 10 o'clock? Is that okay? So they say yes. And even when I call back, the thing is you've got to follow through and deliver. You call back at that time and you ask the same question. They say, no, I'm still busy. You're building up trust. You're building up because you say you're calling when you say you're going to call. And then finally, if you've done that six or seven times, which I have done, people are like, there must be something useful he's got to say, because otherwise he would have stopped calling, right? And, that, and there's a psychological, 
behind it, there is kind of a reasoning behind it. So the psychology behind it. So again, you're like, okay, why is this relevant? But it's relevant because any of you could go into a call center today and get a job. And you might think, like, why would I want to do that? But it, because there's a raw core learning about kind of this process and about selling and about getting yourself in communication and all these things that hopefully will help you build a layer of skin and be able to then, when you've got something that you really believe in, you're passionate about, you've got kind of some skills and learnings from that that you can take um, wherever you go. So they're kind of transferable skills, kind of not to be and not to be dismissed. So the other thing is just in terms of kind of networking and events and kind of the business and, and relationships, people do business with people. And there are kind of just a couple of very brief stories I just wanted to share with you kind of around this. Um, one is I was at a business breakfast networking event, something called BNI, I don't know if anyone's heard of it. Um, and I was in Birmingham and you go, you spend 10, 15 pounds or so, you go to this event, and there was someone from the University of Birmingham, which where I was, and she'd graduated a few years earlier. She ended up introducing me to a lady at KPMG. Um, the lady at KPMG had just started her job, and I helped her over a few months, and it was kind of a conversations about how she can help do promotions and engage kind of with recent graduates and students. And then she just said to me, you know, people do business with people, and we'd really like to work with you. How can we do something together? So she wanted to buy some banners on our site, but she said, look, I gave her a package for around £3,000. She goes, look, I don't want Deloitte on there. I don't want PwC. Um, I just want our, our branding there, and I don't want the others at the same time. So I go, OK, fair enough. Um, well, that's going to be more expensive. Uh, so I ended up charging her £7,000 for this promotion, um, which she bought into. And at the time, and you'll hear more about Student Beans and where we've come from, but that was more money than anything um, combined for all our clients kind of almost so far. And again, this is now seven, eight years ago. But the difference that they made to the business and what she did, but it was about behind all the organizations as well, there are individuals that are making decisions. It's about how you can connect with those people. The other kind of one example, um, that I was at University of Birmingham, and I met a guy. He then became uh, very senior in SEO at an agency called um, Group M. It was MEC Global, based up in Manchester. We connected on LinkedIn. Conversations, he then started doing a bit of work with us, and it's led into um, over 30, 40,000 pounds worth of business. And again, just from one connection um, from university. So what I wanted to do um, was just because I've got the opportunity in captive audience, there's a few pictures of me around the world. I did a gap year, and I went traveling. I did a ski season and a few other things. Um, but what I wanted to do was just get everybody up, because I'm assuming all of you have sat next to probably people that you know. So I want you all to get your things. I want you to go and meet one other random person in the room that you've never met, and just have an open conversation. What are you passionate about? And just share whatever you do. And I expect everyone up, absolutely everyone in the room, please go and find. You've just got like two minutes. Go and find one person, uh, and then we'll go into the session. How's it going? Good to see you. What, All right. what are you passionate about? Um, so I'm passionate about this. You know, I'm, I've come here on a, on a Sunday. Uh, I'm not being paid to be here. And I'm just passionate about helping other people see what the opportunities here are and what's open to them. And like I said, I'm not a superhero. I don't have everything. I don't have all the answers. But if you start something, then you never know what's possible. So that's what I'm passionate about. And what about you? I really don't have sort of an answer. I mean, I'm you must be passionate. What do you love? What when you're in the top of the world, you know, when it's like, wow, I've had a great day. It can be anything. It can be cinema I or film like, or like music. Or I like music. solving like, mathematical problems. Solving mathematical problems. Yeah, but, it's like, but then you're passionate about that. And that's good. And that should be celebrated. That's a great thing. So I'm sure. Cool. How are you finding it so far? This session? I mean, it's really great. Because like, I've been to the like, opening call. It was a bit boring. Never, ne never tell them. But, okay. I mean, this one is like really exciting. Okay, fantastic. I mean, I really so like next year you need to tell them that I should be giving the opening talk. That's, you can write that on the feedback form. I'm sure there is a session. And if you, if you say that, I'd love that. that. That's why I'm here. That's what I'm passionate about. I, if yeah. I can have all the plenary during my session, that's more important for me than anything. I mean, it's like, it's like lots of like, interaction with the public. And, like, yeah. It's not like academically like, boring. It's like, yeah. it's like normal, like, yeah. I mean, normal language. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what I try and do. So thank you for the feedback. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Awesome. Well, thanks thank so much. All right, cool.
Um, great, can everyone grab a seat again? Sorry. Everyone grab a seat. So how do people like that? Do people enjoy that? Yeah? Did you, anyone meet someone that there was like a random connection? You're like, oh, I like that too, or I'm passionate about that too. Yeah, go on, do you want to share what that was? Yeah, Brilliant. crazy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Anyone else want to share a random connection or something good? Yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> so I'm sure they'll nod. Yeah, I like all those things too. Cool. So the point is, that I, I created a very safe, easy environment for you to do that, right? But there's so many times that we just stop ourselves from just doing that, even in this kind of environment, um, even at a conference, you know, there's, at the break, there's gonna be a lunch break after this, and my challenge for everyone in the room is just go and introduce yourself to somebody, just like, again, completely random, even more so than you would normally in this environment, and just introduce yourself and say, what session were you in before lunch? And say something about the session that you've enjoyed or whatever it is that you wanna say about the session that you were in with myself. Again, I'm giving, why am I giving you that? Because it's a line. It's giving you access to something, and what stops us most of the time is that I don't know what to say, and you get paralyzed by you know, not knowing what, what it is to say, whether that be you're in a bar and you want to speak to someone from the opposite sex, whatever it is, you just stop yourself in your tracks because you just uh, what to say, and that's why for, we hate all these chat-up lines, whatever, but actually they're really good because it just gives us something that we then don't even need to think about. So I'm not giving you a chat-up line per se, but if you want to use it in that way, I don't mind. Um, and uh, I'll be invited to the wedding, that would be great. I love, love weddings. Um, but if you want you know, to push yourself out and to challenge yourself in that moment, and I know some of you in the room will go, I know James set me that task or that challenge, but I'm not, you know, I, I feel uncomfortable and I can't, that's why you've got to do it. That's why you've got it, and it's a useful point, actually. I, I saw, does anyone know who Seth Godin is? So I saw him speak a couple of weeks ago, and this is his new book. Um, and does anyone know Icarus, just in terms of the story of Icarus? A few people, so kind of summary, I don't know if I get this right, but it, in, in summary, it's talking about don't fly, he had uh, wings um, attached with wax, and they said don't fly too close to the sun, and then the wax melted, and then, then he ended up dying. But the other bit of the story they said that they don't really share or tell is that they also said, don't fly too close to the ground. Because if he flew too close to the ground and it was too close to the water, that would then also um, you know, end in, in a negative result or end in, in him dying. And so on the front of the book, it says, kind of how high will you fly? And just thinking about that, you know, when you're going away from it, what's the worst thing that can happen you know, when you go and speak to some random person? And a challenge, well, could you imagine just every day you meet just one random, you just introduce yourself, you say hi, whatever it is just how that can result in very different or connections, amazing opportunities that just are all around us every single day, especially whilst you're at university. Because as soon as you get into the wider world, it becomes even more difficult, unfortunately, to, to be in this kind of environment. So those are kind of just a few things that I hope is useful. So there's a sorry for the naked man on the screen, but has anyone heard of this book as well? You'll see, I'm gonna reference some books today because you know, for me, it's about like a starting point and getting kind of questioning and thinking. So there's a fantastic guy called David Taylor, The Naked Leader. Um, and um, Why Naked? It's about stripping away all the hype and all the things about leadership and what you need and whatever it is to kind of the real raw that we are all born with the same, in essence, all born, um, you know, in, in the same kind of form. So why I'm kind of sharing this book is to take you through a bit of the story. I started then University of Birmingham um, after my gap year, and then I, um, I was on the summer ball. I worked with about 30 brands whilst I was a student, um, and then when I was graduating, um, I worked for Yellow Pages as a brand manager. Um, I went to Colombia and the Philippines with an organization called ISEC. So I traveled the world. I've done loads and loads of different things. I worked with some big brands, and then I applied for a few jobs, and when I graduated, and I didn't necessarily get those jobs that I wanted, um, but I saw and I read this book and there's a really simple message, which you can see as a kind of a trend or theme of other messages I've delivered this morning along, you know, what's the worst, what's the best thing that can happen. But the really powerful message, imagine if you couldn't fail. Imagine if you couldn't fail, who would you be, where would you go, and what would you do? And that's like a really exciting message. Like, could you imagine if you couldn't fail? And it's not about thinking positively and hugging trees and just going, oh, great, I'm not going to fail, this is all going to work. But it's, it's that intent and it's that mindset and it's about thinking whatever it is. 
And so I had this idea for, for studentbeans.com, which I'll talk a little bit more about just from a, a kind of background perspective. But it was around, I had this business plan as part of my degree, I had this idea, but I was still telling me, you know, lots of people said, oh, you're too young to set up a business, you don't know, you, how could you possibly be managing people older than you? How? And all of these concerns and problems and challenges, and you justify, we're very good at rationalizing ourselves and saying, what's not possible, we can't do this, we can't do that. But actually, if you apply, imagine if I couldn't fail, I had this strong vision that we had to launch this website and this is what it was gonna be about and it was gonna succeed and there was never then this kind of fear or concern and that was kind of all, all removed away. So I'm gonna go just in terms of behind the beans and a bit of the story and then be able to open up to some questions. Um, but really kind of behind the beans, I was I said a student at the University of Birmingham and I did a lot of research and so I asked kind of lots of students in the room, so imagine who wants, put your hands up if you want uh, discounts at the restaurants. Put your hands up, discounts at restaurants, that sounds good. Put your hands up if you want discounts at the theater or the cinema, sounds good, great. So basically that's what our feedback told us. So I was like, okay, that'd be a good idea. And then we thought, okay, so I went and asked lots of businesses and I kind of go, look, you know, if you're less busy Monday to Thursday or, you know, would you like more custom? Would you like more people? And also not just people that are there today, but people that are going to be then hopefully when they then graduate and they're going to go and be with you a customer for life. And that was our, our proposition. I thought, you know, if we could help businesses, we could help students. It is really simple. And now I know we're consumed by all these voucher codes and everything. But you think about it, this was in 2005, so almost eight years ago now, that we kind of had this original idea. So then this concept, studentbeans.com, and the idea of kind of student stuff made easy, but it was around becoming this staple diet. So as kind of mentioned earlier, it's like baked beans on toast being a staple diet, and the idea of then student beans becoming a staple diet um, of student life. So just to show if, how many people had heard about student beans before I came into the session today. So kind of mo most of the room. So that's like a really exciting thing. For me to stand here as one of the founders, it's like, look, it was an idea. Again, unfortunately, no superpowers. It was just an idea that I believed in and that I worked really, really hard to make come to life and for it to happen. And so the, the story behind that was I was just in Birmingham, as I said, in 2005. Uh, the bank rejected us for a loan. Uh, Lloyd's TSB rejected us for a loan. And then we went to the Prince's Trust, um, who provided us a low interest loan and a mentor. Um, and it's amazing kind of from, there's lots of support out there and I'll talk a bit about startup loans, um, which is available for 18 to 30 year olds now um, in the UK, but it, a small amount of money and investment, but also a belief in our idea. And so we went there and then I was going literally in between graduation ceremony, door to door selling. So I knocked on doors and you remember that earlier, you know, what's the worst thing that can happen? What's the best? And I got loads of no's and I was in these strange dodgy places at 11 at night because that's when the managers were there. But I did everything when everyone else may have stopped. I kept going, I kept going. And so we, we launched the business um, in September 2005 um, with around 200 local businesses signed up. But again, bear in mind, we just had it, it was a holding page, something coming soon. So it was you know, selling into that belief. Has anyone heard of the Lean Startup by Eric Ries? So you know, I looked back and I read the book and I was like, basically that's what we did. You know, we, we just tried it, we did it, and we iterated and we grew and we grew. Um, and so this is then, we, we launched, as I said, in 2005. So that was the original kind of branding and logos, but now this is, this is where it's more kind of at today. So in, in our first year, we signed up 15,000 users in 2005, which is really a beta test stage. In 2006, um, we signed up 50,000 registered users all across the country, and we had kind of brand managers and students working with us. And I personally went to like Jericho and in Oxford, and I was knocking on doors, signing people up, and I literally spent almost two years of my life on the road and speaking and selling and engaging people, whether that be from the brand side and also the students. And then we kind of grew, grew the team. We had a web agency that we were working with originally when we started the business. Um, and we then kind of grew. And in 2007, uh, we then took on our first full-time web developer and kind of members of the team. And uh, in, our, in our third year, 2007, 2008, we signed up 150,000 people. Um, and since we started then today, and this is kind of what the website looks very similar to today, uh, we now reach around 2 million visitors every month. Uh, we sign up over a million registered users. And, um, and it's all around kind of the deals, advice, guidance, um, as Paul kind of in introduced us. Um, but it's really exciting. It's constantly kind of growing, challenging. We're now a team of over 35 people based in Northwest London. Um, and, in, and you may have seen on the first slide, you know, here to share as well, we didn't get any funding. So we just built an organic business from scratch that's paying, you know, living the lives of 35 people and more um, and making a real, real difference. And that's what I wanted to do kind of when I graduated and, and, and to set up and to, to be something that is making a difference. 
So this as well, um, we launched the world's first online freshers fair, uh, which went really well. We had around 300,000 visitors to that. So lots of brands kind of bought into different stands, just like kind of complementing going around the country at the same time. And we're going to view that kind of bigger and better than that sold out kind of last year, around 60 brands kind of buying into that, which is fantastic. Uh, we've got something called Refreshers Wall, which is live at the moment. So lots of deals, promotions, and engagements. You've got kind of, I think it's 20% off your rail card. How many of you own a rail card in, in the room, just to see? So a lot of you, if you don't have one, then you can get an exclusive discount on them. But there's lots of things on there, whether it be from giraffe and food and eating out. And there's constantly we're kind of being updated and, and changing all the time. It's been featured a lot in the press. And there's my brother and business partner. Not the bean, but the one to the right. Um, and uh, so he, I founded the business with my brother. So the two of us, he graduated from Nottingham, a couple of years older than me. Uh, but it was my idea. He came up with the name. Uh, so I think a fantastic partnership and you know, built on trust and a kind of a foundation. And he now runs the business day to day as managing director. And then I'm kind of more um, about kind of external relations and building kind of the profile and building new strategic partnerships and working uh, with some fantastic kind of brands. It's head of new business. So today, the Beans Group, and you'll be like, what's the Beans Group compared to, to Student Beans? So it's really about kind of growing up as an organization. So we've got also More Beans, which is for life after university, and that's growing as a kind of a separate entity in itself. So it's all how we can be relevant and useful, obviously, kind of when you graduate. Um, and so it's kind of the, the intent around that. And there's a lot that goes in behind to making sure that Student Beans and More Beans and our other propositions kind of really help kind of grow and develop. And we've got a big business to business kind of marketing arm all around research and insights. So I don't know how many of you saw the student drinking survey last year. I don't know if anyone saw that. So no, so that's something to look out for, but student drinking, student sex survey, league tables, and all these things that all of you guys, apparently you absolutely love um, because that's what it shows kind of on the, on the site. So it's all kind of data driven around kind of insights and, and context and what people want. So anyone thought, why is a purple cow on the screen? Has anyone heard of the book, uh, Purple Cow by Seth Godin as well? giving him a good plug. So it's all about standing out. You know, are people going to talk about your product or service? Are people engaged? And if they're not, then you should maybe rethink it. Because our job and our mission is like, look, you know all the students. If there's a great deal, you're going to use it and tell people about it. If it's not great, you're not going to use it. So you know, if we've got a partner that comes on going, great, you know, I'll give you 10% off coffee before 9 o'clock in the morning, it's not going to be useful. <laughs> it's not exciting. And so our challenge is to go, look, and also, from if you're starting up a business, why not create something that people do get excited and talk about? So a lot of what we did was all around social by design, so getting people talking um, by using and doing kind of what we do. So survival, we don't want to just survive, but a lot of business and challenges, they create a business. And I'm sure either you've got parents or families or friends that are like working hard, working hard, but not necessarily succeeding in a way that they want to succeed. And it says kind of why most businesses, has anyone heard of this book before? A couple of people most fantastic book and as I read it it was all around creating systems and structures around kind of if you're going to franchise your business even if you're not going to franchise it think about it like you are so you know you've got the systems and processes and things set up in place so whether we like McDonald's or not it's a fantastic organization based on the process they've done so that one plus one always equals one so as your organization as well who comes in who sets things up and how if someone was away for a week would they know what they needed to do and if you were away because most people create jobs for themselves you know so if you're a baker you want to set up bakery you know you could just work at Greg's or wherever it is and you work there but instead you set up your own you need to open you need to close up you need to do cleaning you can do all these other things and you're likely in the first early years to spend more time in the business than you will if you were working for somebody else and you're probably going to be paid less that's kind of very real. But then you can do that maybe in the first, you know, first year, second year. But then it's the longevity. Do you want to be doing that for the rest of your life? And basically what most people do is they create jobs for themselves. And that's not being an entrepreneur. That's being your, your self employed you're employing yourself. And so there are three stages that happen. One is those businesses then decide to stop. Two, they then decide to, um, to either, yeah, sorry, to stop. Two is they then ended up um, like processing and, and putting these things in place. Or three, they continue and life's just hard. And I don't know about you, but I'm sure there are people that you know that are probably still living in a very hard way, that it doesn't need to be like that. And that book's kind of a great way to do it. And then succeed, looking again at reference points to a few different books, and then I'm going to open up for questions. But Good to Great, has anyone heard of this one? Fantastic book, looking at about in terms of the future. And as an organization, we've got like a 25-year vision. And um, there's something, a big, hairy, audacious goal. It's putting it out there, and it's, it's businesses that are really great. And partly, look, we don't have investment and funding, so it's not about focusing what's our three-year return that we're going to give to our investors. We're thinking bigger than that. And you can still do that if you've got the right investors aligned with what you want to do and what you want to achieve. But it's about going, right, where's the intent? Where are we going? How are we going to get there? And if you know where you want to go, 
then you know, kind of, you work it backwards. It's very simple. There's a, on the book, Seven Habits, start with the end in mind. You know, where, where is it? So our 25 year vision is to touch the lives of 100 million young people every day. So that's like the intent. We're out there. This is what we're building. We're growing. Um, and our mission is to make life a little more awesome. So it's about this contribution. It's about making a difference. It's about, you know, when people, I've met someone a couple of weeks ago, it's her 21st birthday, and she goes, I use student beans for my 21st birthday. And that association that when she met me was so excited. I'm sure you've each got an individual story, perhaps, of something, hopefully, that we've done. And if we've not done it yet, that's what we kind of want to do and want to create. So a fantastic book showing kind of what great people. I know Judy Mayer as well in the session earlier was talking about focusing on your strengths. This is a fantastic book kind of really to help understand that maybe a bit more called First Break All the Rules. And it's about understanding people don't change. You know, we're in relationships, the easiest analogy to show, and we try and change people. We go, oh, if I get them to do this, it will be much better for everyone, and we try and mould and change. But similarly, when we employ people as well, we think, oh, they're good at this, but I need them to do this, and let's focus on those things of how we can change them. And there was a very simple story at the beginning of the book that talks about a frog and a scorpion, and the scorpion wanted to cross the river. And uh, the frog goes, no, if I put you on my back and we cross the river, you're going to sting me. And the scorpion's like, no, no, if I sting you, we'll both die. So that went backwards and forwards a little bit. And then finally, the frog goes, OK, fine. So the scorpion gets on the frog. They go across the river. The scorpion stings the frog. They're both dying, and they're in the river. And the frog's like, why did you do this? We're now both dying. And the scorpion goes, it's in my nature. And we spend all our time trying to you know, change, change us. But actually, if we focus on the things that we're great at and what we can do and where we can add the most value, and that's why I'm not managing director of the business today. Because Michael is amazing at the systems, at the process, about making things happen. And running a business versus starting one up are two very, very different things. And so it's about acknowledging that. And that's why they say a lot of entrepreneurs don't get out of their own way fast enough because they're too attached to it or they're too stuck in the day to day. And I said about 18 months ago, 20 months ago, I, I need, we need more people in the business. And we've now got around 10 people doing what I was single handedly doing, which I just don't even know how I did it, but I did. But that was then able to, for the business to then grow. Uh, and so that's really, really important. And related to that book, there's another one called Now Discover Your Strengths. And at the back of the book, there's a test, um, which is free. So the book costs seven quid or whatever. Um, and then you can do a test, which gives you your five strengths in order of, of strength, the most predominant strength for that. And it's also been a really useful tool that we've done. And they've got a sales one as well. But that's by Marcus Buckingham, and you can kind of find them online. Um, so, so I think those, those are kind of really useful. See? The other thing is, has anyone heard of this book, Getting Things Done? So a couple of people. I only went through this process about a year and a half ago or something. It's really made a difference to me. And I wish I had it when I was studying and, and when I graduated in early years in the business, because it's about a process of how you can organize yourself and be effective and get things done. So I thought if I'm here, uh, again, I'm not on commission. I sound like I am, but I'm not commissioned for any of these books. Um, you know, I, I just, I, I'm so passionate about them because they really made a difference to me. And there are lots out there, but these ones for me kind of really, really did. So uh, quote, make it so, because a vision without action is just a dream. An action without vision just passes time. But a vision with an action changes the world. And my challenge for you today is to think about, you know, it's not just having that idea, but it's about the execution. It's about making it happen. It's about taking that first step, whatever it is, that maybe you've been putting something off. Um, or like I said, that challenge when you go out of here just to speak to one random person and ask them that question or engage in that way and share. So I'm also an ambassador for something called Startup Loans. Has anyone, how many people have heard of Startup Loans? You should have done, because Julie should have mentioned it as well. Um, but there are lots of kind of opportunities out there. And they, it's a low interest loan um, available for 18 to 30 year olds kind of in the UK. And it provides a mentor and support similar to the Princess Trust and how we started. And that's why I'm an ambassador for it, because I really believe in it. And I believe, aside from this, there are lots of other kind of opportunities out there that can kind of help. Um, so I'd like to open it up. Um, for, for questions, uh, and then I've just got kind of one more thing to wrap up. Um, also, if you enjoyed the session today, I've got to say this because I always forget, but you know, the only reason why we've grown is because we've had a following of students you know, do and, and have engaged with us and then shared. And so if you enjoyed the session, um, or if you want to just help a business continue to grow, go on, I was going to ask everyone to do it, go on your phones on Facebook now and just update saying the founder of Student Beans was here or whatever, or link to us or like us. That kind of thing, because that, that makes a difference for us as a business. You know, not being paid to be here. It's a Sunday. I'm working still 15 hour, whatever days. I'm doing it just because, you know, you can say, well, I'm promoting this. It's not about that. It's about hopefully helping you make a difference and just changing that 1% or that one angle or that one thought process um, that can then hopefully help you in whatever journey. It doesn't matter if you're setting up or you're going to go into a business, because I know if you apply yourself and make that difference or think, what can I contribute as opposed to what can I get from this? 
the world, I think, will be a better place because I think we can achieve more together. So open for questions now. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a really good question, and that's partly for the Beans Group, as a, I guess as a why we're now the Beans Group, and so that there's the opportunity of kind of extending that kind of lifetime value and the opportunity and how we can... It is, you can hear hopefully the intent of it's all about making a difference of what we can do to add as most value as we can. Um, there's a lot of kind of... We've had brand managers and students on the ground, and, and we will do that also going forward, so that's kind of one of the things, kind of brand advocates. But it's also a lot of, you know, you go back to the purple cow, and it's about word of mouth, and it's you can't you can't buy that. You, can, you know, it's very difficult for you to create that. But the, yeah. So I, I asked obviously a share of hands. How many people have heard about us? How many people heard about us because someone told you about us? So like word of mouth, you probably and if you didn't know where it came from, it probably came from from exactly what you've just said, which is the hardest thing to kind of replicate or for, for, for someone to do. And that's hopefully because we made it very easy and it's tangible. And, and also we don't need everyone to sign up necessarily, but if you've got in a household one person that's constantly kind of engaged and, and finding out about it or using it, then they're going to tell naturally kind of everyone else. Or if you're going to go um, for a restaurant, you'll go with four other people. You'll go, oh, we've saved this money because we've got this. And it's all of that kind of thing. Um, so I wish I could say, yeah, this is how you replicate it and do it. But it, it is, it's, it's intrinsic to kind of what we've done. There's obviously social media. So we've got around now 100,000 kind of followers stroke fans on Facebook, around 80,000 Facebook, 20,000 or so on Twitter. And that's kind of constantly growing and engaging. So there's that. There's our email newsletter and kind of promotions that go out. But it's about being relevant, useful, and interesting. And there is a natural feedback from second and third years that, you know, that's kind of a very close-knit community that, you know, Um, yeah, no, there, there's a consist from our side, we're consistently like delivering and engaging more, but there's, yeah, there's both a balance about going out, signing up more people, and then also being relevant around the content, and we're doing kind of everything that we can to continue to grow, so that's cool. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, you said that you were traveling around for about two years. Yeah. Like that. I imagine that must put a strain on your personal relationships. Yeah. Could you share with us some tips about how you kept in touch? Yeah. I think, I, I mean, I was, I was literally going door to door selling in, in every city more or less that we've launched in and and then there's a top up and then visiting when we had brand managers and all of those kind of things. So yeah, absolutely. I think the the real friends are still your friends. You know, there are some people that I've met with on my travels, whether it be from Philippines or Colombia, wherever it is that I've been, and you can just pick things up just after and it and it doesn't and I think that's your true friends come out. And um, you know, I'm not gonna lie, I think it there are lonely elements to it because I think my peer group as well don't necessarily understand what I'm going through and they're just, you know, out and enjoying themselves. And I think it's always greener on the other side. I think there's also perception wise. And I think my biggest challenge was every time I was in London, which was such a short period, people stop inviting me to certain things because they're like, oh, James is never around anyway. So it's, it's hard sometimes. But then you just you're, when you're available, you're available and you, you know, it's. Um, you don't let it, you know, you don't let it get to you and you've got to make the effort. And I think the key thing is it's about having, you know, a diary, like if it's not in my calendar diary, it's not happening. So like my social life is around that as well. And you just, you, you build your relationships and you, you put the effort in. It's what's important. I think there's a phrase, you know, if you water it and you give it attention, it will flourish. And if you don't, then it will die. And I think that's the same. Um, but I think I've got a great group of friends to support me. So, yeah. Yeah, so great question. Um, it's not, I'm an ideas person, you might be able to tell that. Um, and I kind of think big, and that's why Michael is a, Michael's not a tech founder as well. So it's quite interesting from a, yeah. we founded the business without a tech founder. Yeah. Um, and we went to an agency and we got them to do the site in the first time. And then we built it and then we bought tech in, in house. So I also would, it's a great example of don't let that stop you. Like if you've got an idea and you want something so to happen. Yeah. Yeah, I think, well, that's why when we had the agency that were working with us, that was kind of quite a challenging relationship because we always 
it wanted more, and it was kind of quite reactive. And you know, was, when you're founding it, because like I said, we didn't get funding, it was all kind of we wanted more, and that's kind of challenges. But then you know, we recruited people that we trusted, and I think it just got to come down to that. So I was at the University of Birmingham, and I went and ended up giving a talk, and it was a Friday night. It was the most horrendous talk I've ever. I was heckled. It was in the student union. It was like the worst, worst thing ever. And then a, a guy came up to me and goes to me, "Hey, um, I like your website, but I think there are a few things with it that could be made better." So I was like, oh, "Okay, what's that?" And then I was in Birmingham over the weekend, so we met up for a drink, and then. He goes, well, look, I said, we'll give you um, advertising if you can do a report about what, because he was helping other people s design websites. And then a few months later, I was like, remember that guy that gave us that advice? Maybe he's the one to help us take the business forward. And so there, there's trust at the end of the day. You know, you're selling a vision and an idea. And again, it's whether you're recruiting all these other people that are, the idea is they are better than you. <laughs> they know more than you about what they do. And, and you know, that's what you've got to do. So, cool. Yeah. Do you have um, any particular marketing questions that other similar websites weren't doing? Um, I think the one thing was very interesting. There was another site that launched a similar time to us, and they were trying to do um, selling books. Um, there was, it's not the same. There was a company in Birmingham that were doing it, but they were doing books, accommodation, lots and lots of things. And I guess what it is about being true to one thing originally, like Amazon now, you can get everything from them, but originally it was just about the books. And so I would just be like, what does it mean? What does it mean for your customer? Like, why will they sign up to you from a proposition from both companies and students? And being core and really, really focused around that is like my one thing that maybe we succeeded when others didn't because we were just being like, this is what we're doing. And you know, now there is more. Um, but that's partly on brand around student beans being maybe like Amazon being all encompassing and lots of things in there um, and student beans as well. So anyone from over this side conscious of? Yeah? Um, you said you had about 35 staff. Yeah. I was just wondering if you could outline what kind of successful companies are. Um, yeah, so, so the business is really split. And, and like I said, it says up there we're recruiting as well. But everything from um, designers, developers, um, email marketing, social media, um, business development, delivery, um, so there's HR administration. And it, I mean, it really transcends almost every business function that you could think. And we're recruiting around 10 people at the moment as well. that are also across board in, in the different functions to kind of help us grow. So it's a vague answer, but it's, that's where it's at. <laughs> so we don't outsource anything as well. So there's not you know, agencies or designers. Where it's all in-house. And we wanted to do that because we want to build a team. And it's about doing things. Yeah. That's how we're different. We don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's that? It's because you're losing your market. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. So we are launching something. Um, so stay tuned. And that's going to be out very soon. Um, why are we different? So um, hopefully a number of you in the room will also be able to say this. But it's about being relevant and being kind of more useful and more engaging than, I guess, the more broad kind of wider market. Um, and, and that's, I guess, our, our unique proposition was around from a student perspective because lots of brands are more interested as well, potentially in, in a more niche demographic as opposed to going something for everyone. And so there's, we're also not a site that you know, you're in the basket and check out online and then you'll go and get a code from us. Like We don't position ourselves in that way, whereas those sites are also really fantastic. I know a lot of the founders and, and whatever of them. And so we're in, I say, a similar space, but it's more about how we can add value. And I think, you know, what's the difference? Guaranteed their mission 25 years is not to touch the lives of 100 million young people. It's, you know, they are delivering on a different message and a different promise. And I think that excites me, that inspires me and hopefully the team and, and the people that we interact with to, to give us a guidance that we are, we are different from that. And it's not just about that, I guess, money saver, which is also a really valuable, obviously, point. But um, so we are launching the apps and the kind of other things coming out around that and to do with kind of location base. But it's about standing and representing and being more relevant for, for, for students and young people. Right, yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so the question around kind of how we make money. So it's various through kind of different advertising streams, but you know, the easiest thing, you know, there are, there are sponsors for it. You walk down the street and you see a billboard, someone's paid for the billboard to be there. So it's a very simple you know, revenue model around we've created an audience and we can now get around 2 million visitors a month. And so it is through kind of the different revenue streams, whether that be billboard advertising or you know, engagement or homepage takeovers. Um, and then there's also kind of when people buy and sell something, we, we get a revenue and that kind of thing. But it's, it is it's broad. We're not reliant on kind of just what just one avenue. And um, 
you know, as, as the business has grown, there have been so many new different revenue streams that have kind of opened in the last seven years that weren't there when we started. And so the original business model was very simple around charging local businesses to pay us for like a subscription service. Um, and then that's kind of evolved and changed. Um, but it's all about win-win. It's about how we can help. If we can help yourselves from a student perspective, you know, adding value, and then we can help the businesses and we're making some money along the way. How we do that, it's also very variant depending on what the client wants, what they're trying to do. And we're committed to going, look, let's make this work for you. And if you're going to work, then it will, you'll come back to us next year and the year after. If it doesn't work, then they're not interested. So that's how can we make it work? And then we work everything backwards from that conversation. So we may be more flexible. Like, we're not like, I can't stand here and go, we're Groupon. You know, like, we're not a model that does this like this because it, it's kind of more broad and flexible. And partly because as we founded the business, there's been so many changes, but us wanting to deliver and add value. And it's, it's very different from the original business plan. So.